Good morning. My name is Libby Williams. I am the AMP SoCal Project Manager, and we are so glad that you have chosen to spend your morning with us. We hope that you will walk away from this event with information that can help you to grow your business, and also with new connections to help you further your organization's mission. I want to take a few moments to introduce the Center for Economic Development, who is the host of the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership for Southern California. Look at that. Ooh, look, my name's still up there. <laughs> so um, thank you for that, Lieutenant Colonel Atkins. <laughs> so the USC Center for Economic Development is within the Price School, uh, School of Public Policy. And what we do is we focus on economic development within the community. We work with cities, we work with counties, municipalities, and agencies to help them uh, determine what are the needs they have in terms of attraction, business retention, how can they further grow job growth within their region. That's one of the things that we are experts at. We have morphed as well to working with the community with a grant that we have from the Department of Commerce and also the Department of Defense. But what we're most proud of is we are training the future leaders in public policy by way of having our students directly involved in what we're doing. And I have to stop and pause and say without those students, we could not have pulled off any of the things that we do, and definitely not this event. So if you wouldn't mind, I want to give a big round of applause to, we don't call them interns, they are our research associates from the Center of Economic Development. Can you just say thank you to them? Yeah. To their, you guys stand up. They don't want to stand up. They're shy now. But they really are, um, they are an integral part, and we're very proud of the fact that we put students out into the community in all different areas of public policy and business development and the like throughout the country and the world. USC Center for Economic Development hosts, as I said, the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership for Southern California. For those of you who are unfamiliar with AMP SoCal, we are a federally designated manufacturing community from the Department of Commerce. We have a focus on the 10 county area of Southern California. So everything from San Luis Obispo all the way down to the border is what we focus on. And the reason why is because this region is number one in aerospace and defense in the country. We always have been and we are determined to keep it that way. Now we accomplish this by bringing together academia, government, industry to address the needs of aerospace and defense manufacturers. So you know, there are 24 manufacturing communities throughout the US. There are about five of us that are focused on aerospace and defense. The others are focused on shipmaking, agriculture, and other areas. But we all have the focus of working with companies that are in advanced manufacturing because we know that's where the good jobs are. And that's where we want to focus our strength and attention. Amsel Cal has many, many partners, and you will see them around the room today. They're all around you with our sponsors as well as at our tables. We could not do any of this without them. They are what helps make us, both the large OEMs as well as the smaller companies as well as the universities and the other uh, organizations that provide um, assistance like CMTC and the Workforce Development Boards. These are all of our partners. How we help. Now, Amsel Cal has a number of different resources, and we want to make sure that's one of the things that you know you can count on us and use us as a resource and as a tool. So we have a talent pipeline. One of the biggest complaints that we have been hearing from manufacturers is that your industry is aging. Oftentimes, the companies that we work with, that we meet, the average age of the employees is around 50 years old, and they're on the cusp of getting ready to retire. And there's not a lot of pipeline that we see that is being developed to fill and backfill that space. Mind you, I said we want to make sure we maintain our space at number one. In order to do that, we have got to develop that talent. How we do that is by working with the different universities, the workforce training providers, the community colleges. For example, we had a manufacturing boot camp at East LA College along with UCLA that was an intensive program that helped introduce people who wanted to go into manufacturing just to give them the basics. And that way, they were ready to be hired by companies that then would give them the specific skills and training for their particular machinery. But at least they had an understanding of the basics of manufacturing. We're trying to duplicate this around the 10 county area. We've had other successful programs in other community colleges, but honestly, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what we really need to do. But again, that's why we're here and that's why we have our partners and why you're in the room as well. We have a red carpet service. So if you have a need, you're not even sure what it might be, but it might be that you've got a workforce. It might be that your utility rates are too high. It might be that you're about to invest in new equipment and you want to see if there are any type of tax assistance programs that the state might offer you. 
Absolutely, yes to all of those things, and we want to help offer that assistance. We might not be the one who provide that direct assistance, but we can definitely be that resource to give you a guide and a warm handshake to the right organization, be it a college, be it a workforce training provider, be it financing assistance. We can do all of that. We just ask you to use, use us as a resource so that we can uh, help you avoid having to run around all over the county. And also to show that the state, the county, and the city are actually much more business friendly than one might think. And I'm hoping you'll hear more of that as we go through the program today. Innovation forums. We host innovation forums on a quarterly basis. We do this for the benefit of aerospace and defense manufacturers. We have recently had one just last Friday for UAV manufacturers at the LA Chamber of Commerce. And for the first time, we also held it online. We're gonna start doing more of that because we know 10 county area is so spread out, you always can't go to all the things you'd like to go to, but you can hopefully easily join us from your desk for a couple hours. But we're focusing on UAVs because that is definitely a growth industry and we wanna be there to help support them. In the past, we've held other innovation forums on how to write a winning SBIR proposal. We've had one on technology transfer where we had five of the leading universities, including USC, that brought their information on their research and development that they had that was available for license out of their engineering schools. A lot of small companies don't have their own R&D uh, departments. And the universities have been doing that R&D. Many of them have license agreements that you can, as a small business, have at a discounted rate. We want to make sure that you know about these different resources so that you can apply it for hopefully the growth within your own company. Uh, we've also had one on small satellites and CubeSats. So we're trying to focus on the areas that that you might want to see. If you have an interest in a particular focus or topic, please let us know, because that's what we're here for. We're here to focus on the things that you like and that you would like to see. One of the things I want to highlight in terms of the other assistance that we offer, at the very bottom, you see we have our Strengthening Competitive Program. We are targeting defense-impacted firms. That's where part of our funding from the Department of Defense comes in. They have a mission to make sure that the supply chain here in, in Southern California maintains its strength, even in the ups and downs. And we know that when things go down, sometimes you get contracts other places and commercial and other areas. But they want to make sure that you are not so dependent upon them that when they got to take a downturn, that you get topsy-turvy and perhaps even go away. We don't want that to happen. We want to maintain and even grow. So if you are defense-impacted firms, we have got a wonderful program. We've got a great manager of that program, Tomas Duran. Tomas, are you in the room? Where are you? Tomas Duran right here. Please feel free to see him anytime when you're through here. Um, and even if you're not defense-impacted, again, we encourage you to use us as a resource. That's what we're here for. So. Lastly, but not least, I need to thank our sponsors. We want to thank the Economic Development Administration. Again, they are the reason why AMSOCAL exists, and they were our beginnings, and we're so happy to have them here. And you're going to hear from Will Marshall shortly. CalEd has come in, the California Association of Local Economic Development. Their entire mission is to focus on economic development throughout the state of California. We're so pleased to have them as a partner with us today. March Day PA. I don't know how many of you know March Day PA. You know that there's Air Force Base. It's no longer Air Force Base. They've got plenty of land. So if you are looking to expand, you might want to check March Day PA out, and they have got a table here as well. So that's a plug. They're in the back of the room. CETA. It's also a part or an arm of CalEd. It's the financing arm for economic development, and we're happy to have them. California State University Northridge. So I have my degree, a degree from, uh, from USC, but my heart belongs to the state schools. I got my first degree from Cal State Long Beach. So I love state schools and institutions. CSUN is a prime example of the great work they're doing with building future engineers. And uh, we're so happy to have them as a partner as well. And they are too are in the back of the room. Lewis Group of Companies. Lewis Group of Companies has helped sponsor our reception for the afternoon. For those of you who are registered for the Economic Development Workshop, we're happy to have you. And Lewis Group of Companies is providing, providing the refreshments. And the City of Paris, who also has a table right over here. And again, City of Paris, another place to think about opportunities for growth. They've got plenty of land. And uh, I can attest as well, I am also from the IE. So the IE, a wonderful place to think of to expand. And last but not least, Elsevier, who is also in the back of the room. Elsevier, we met at a recent conference for state economic development. And we're so happy that they came on board. Please do check out their booth as well. There's a number of resources. You might be interested from them as well, especially if you've never heard of them. I hear their name every morning because I listen to NPR and they also sponsor NPR. So you're learning a lot about me today. All right. 
At this time, I want to bring up the dean of our School of uh, Public Policy. Our dean, Jack Knott, is extremely supportive of what we're doing, and we're so excited to have him here with us this morning to give a welcome and just to share with you more about what great things we've got going on in the School of Public Policy here at USC. On behalf of the USC Sol Price School of Public Policy, it's my great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to AMP SoCal Biennial Meeting. Uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the most important things we do as a school, and we're very pleased that you are here to participate. Uh, I did want to take just a moment to uh, congratulate our uh, USC Center for Economic Development uh, for putting this uh, program together. And I want to thank Director Leonard Mitchell, uh, Deepak Ball, Dion Jackson, and Liddy as well. So could you give them a round of applause for putting this program together? And I'm especially happy to also speak to you just briefly about the Price School and the important work that we do and the students uh, that we educate. Many of you may not be aware that USC has one of the very oldest and highest ranked public policy schools in the country. We were founded in 1929, so we're about uh, in a couple of years to celebrate our 90th anniversary. We were founded actually at the instigation of Los Angeles city leaders who wanted civil servants, public administrators, as well as urban planners who were professionally trained and able to respond to the needs of a fast-growing city. And our first classes were actually held in City Hall uh, with the sponsorship of the City of Los Angeles. So from the beginning, we have had a mission to support LA and Southern California. And of course, today, the Price School Center for Economic Development is a central part and continues to be a central part of that mission. A recent uh, external evaluation that we conducted of the center, we evaluate all our centers on a five-year rotating basis, said, quote, it is widely recognized as one of the premier urban economic and community and business development programs in the country, noted for its wide and deep engagement in programs, projects, and initiatives. And so we're very proud of the center and all the work that it does. Initiatives like the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership for Cali Southern California, AMP SoCal, exemplifies the value of collaboration across sectors, which is a hallmark of what we want to do as a university. It brings together the public, private, uh, nonprofit, government, and academia to tackle these really hard problems. We also know that we must employ an interdisciplinary, solution focused approach. And our faculty have expertise in a range of interrelated fields, including public and nonprofit management, public finance, policy analysis, urban planning, and urban economics. And we apply this interdisciplinary expertise to address issues of transportation, infrastructure, social policy, health policy, and of course, uh, urban economic development, including issues such as workforce development, and the manufacturing sector and how best to support public-private partnerships, which is an important topic for today. So I want to thank all of you for attending. Uh, I know it's going to be a productive day, and I look forward to learning about all of the discussions that you have. So thank you very much. At this time, though, I want to bring up one of our staunchest advocates from the Center for Economic Development and one of our longtime supporters of CED, a man who has been working for 30 years in public policy and economic development, uh, who has been working the last 12 years as the economic development representative for EDA in this region. Mr. Will Marshall, would you come on up and welcome us to the program? Thank you. I think the worst part of Today will be my walking all the way up here from in the back somewhere. So Libby, maybe we ought to have a roving mic of some kind so we can get closer to the people. As Libby mentioned, I've been with EDA for a couple of months, about 29 years, I'll say. So, when she asked that I come be with you today, I wanted to know 
what role would I play? And uh, she said that uh, uh, she wanted to find somebody in EDA that could answer all of the questions that you may have about EDA, specifically about EDA and the program that we operate. And we have been funding this particular part of the Price School for a number of years, more than 10, and um, they get a fairly nice piece of change from us over the term of a grant they, they might have, and we have been extremely pleased. So uh, I bring good wishes to all of you from A. Leonard Smith, the regional director of EDA, who resides in Seattle and who happened to be in Hawaii today. And I was scheduled to go, and he was going to come here. But since, since I work for him, and he doesn't work for me, I didn't get to go. So he took that trip himself. So we'll, I'll counsel with him on his return on uh, why I didn't make the trip. But I don't think I will win that one. Uh, so a little bit about EDA. Uh, we are an agency in commerce, we're one of many. And uh, we provide funds usually to nonprofits, cities and counties, any subunits of the state that would be interested in new job creation. Whatever we do, you have to prove to us uh, that you can, you will, and you did provide X number of jobs based on the amount of money that you want to get from us. So we are not, we are not a social agency. We are not a do-gooder agency. We have a primary function of determining some place in the region, some place in your city, some place in your county that needs assistance in order to have new job creation. And that's where we should focus our time and effort and money. So if you are in Long Beach or if you're in Santa Monica, uh, wherever, uh, and you find that there is a section of the city or a section of the county that's lagging economically, then we ought to target that place. You ought to target that place and then come to us and say, if we do A, B, and C, we ought to be able to bring new companies into East Long Beach or, or South Compton or wherever so that uh, uh, we can have better, more job creation for the people that live close by. And if we can help you, the city or the county or a nonprofit corporation, do something to uh, make it easier for companies like you to come into these negative communities, we are willing to do that. But in all cases, it's EDA working with the local institution. It's not EDA working with individuals. The only program that we have where individuals would be involved is our revolving loan program. And in that case, we make a grant to a local institution, whether it's a nonprofit corporation, whether it's the city, the county, or uh, some special group, a uh, subunit of the state. We make a grant to them and let them determine what kind of, sub, uh, uh, what kind of uh, loans need to be made in that place in order to have small companies uh, be uh, healthier, become healthier, or to do specifically what they need to do. Uh, we have three basic programs, and I promised uh, my friend that I would not linger so long on these individual things, because you can ask, ask questions. I'll be here all day, and I promise her that there will be no question that you ask that I can't have an answer or get an answer while you're here today. So uh, we have loans that we make through grants to intermediaries, 
We have construction and non-construction activities that we finance for cities and counties, and we end up preparing or help to prepare places for you private sector companies to bring your expansion product or, or start a new company in the area where it's needed, and uh, we'll help you de reduce development costs by upgrading the water or the sewer or the roads or whatever is needed that the city or the county normally would do but find themselves not in a position to do. Uh, so we can do construction or non-construction. Non-construction just might be design and preparing for construction later on. And uh, if we can do projects, two or three million dollars each, where you would provide the local share, you to, again, the city or the county, then we can reduce some of the problems that we would have from having new companies move into your community. So uh, uh, may I ask how many individuals here represent uh, private sector companies? That's a quick raise of the hand. Okay, how many represent municipalities? Oh, quite a few, that's good. Usually we, in these kind of meetings, we get primarily private sector companies, but I'm pleased to see that we have some uh, public entities represented. Uh, so we should be able to have lots of questions today, uh, to get lots of answers today, so we can bring lots of new jobs into Southern California. I cover uh, 20 counties in California and all of Nevada. So the 20 counties in California would be everything from Sacramento South, everything from San Luis Obispo South, and from Mono Inyo County South, uh, and all of Nevada. So I should be able to have something of interest to talk to you about today while I'm here. So thanks again for allowing me to share a moment with you. Uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, let's get some new jobs in our area. Thank you. Thank you, Will. So, we have a special guest. Oftentimes in aerospace and defense, it seems like we don't get the same attention that other industries do, like entertainment and agriculture. But this morning, we're honored to have with us a California State Representative who understands the need to make manufacturing a priority in this state. And in particular, he understands the value of aerospace and defense to our state's economy. And let me tell you a little secret. He actually called us because he just wanted to attend the meeting. He didn't want to speak. He didn't ask to speak. But we want to make sure that we get to hear from him because we don't have, in our opinion, enough representatives in Sacramento that understand and embrace manufacturing, and especially not necessarily aerospace and defense. So at this time, would you help welcome representing the 66th Assembly District, Assemblymember Al Marasucci. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Libby, for that kind of introduction. My name is Al Marasucci, and uh, not only do I have the privilege of representing the South Bay area of Los Angeles, uh, what I like to call the aerospace capital of the world, but uh, also, I have the privilege of serving as the chair of the Assembly Select Committee on Aerospace. And so as a chair of the Aerospace Committee, uh, it is my job to be uh, the biggest booster of aerospace and defense in the state of California, this iconic, proud history that we have uh, here in our Golden State. As the chair of the Assembly Committee, I speak with a lot of folks in the industry as well as uh, uh, folks in academia working with the aerospace and defense industries, and I sense a lot of uh, new optimism with Cal the California aerospace industry. You know, some say that California, and particularly Southern California, is making a comeback as the aerospace capital of the world. The Los Angeles Economic Development Report from 2016 on the industry describe Southern California as continuing to be one of the world's most competitive regions for aerospace innovation. 
We have the modern day equivalent of the space race taking place, a lot of exciting activity. We have the growth, exciting growth in unmanned vehicles. And of course, we have the uh, signs of increased defense spending that is going to benefit uh, all of the aerospace and defense industries. As many of you know, especially folks that raised your hands earlier uh, with the private sector, the reason why Southern California continues to lead the nation and the world in aerospace innovation and, adva and advanced manufacturing is, as the LA ADC described it, the deep ecosystem of talent, expertise, and skills, the, the people that all of you represent. Southern California has and continues to have the best workforce. People have been building planes and rockets and satellites and their parts for decades. The state of California needs to continue to invest in the aerospace and defense industries by helping the industry grow, investing in our universities. Thank you very much, USC, for hosting today's uh, wonderful event. I'll say that even as a proud UCLA Bruin. <laughs> we'll see in two weeks, yeah. Um, of course, community colleges, our Cal State University is good to see uh, Cal State Northridge represented today. We need to continue to focus on and invest more in STEM education and in career technical education. You know, when I talk to a lot of aerospace people and they're saying that they're competing with high tech to try to attract the best minds to come into uh, aerospace and defense, you know, I tell them, well, what could be more exciting to, than to uh, be part of the next generation uh, of the space race, you know, in the race to put the first man or woman on Mars or any of the other planets in our solar system. So we need to continue to have these strong public-private partnerships, not only with our universities, our community colleges, our education system, but also, of course, with our legislature. I know that uh, the state of California today is not only represented by myself, but also we have Jeff Mallon from the, the Office of uh, Governor Jerry Brown. Where is Jeff? They're in the back there. Thank you very much for, for representing uh, uh, the governor's office. I'd like to just uh, briefly talk about some of the, the things that I've been working on to support the aerospace industry. In 2013, I worked with SpaceX and others to, to write a tax incentive law, AB 777, to help keep SpaceX from leaving the state of California, to keep them in California, to continue to grow and anchor California's private space exploration industry. In 2014, I, I co-authored another tax law, AB 2389, to help Northrop Grumman successfully win one of the biggest defense contracts in decades. Of course, the contract to build the B-21 bomber in Palmdale, uh, a contract that's going to bring over 6,500 manufacturing jobs to Southern California. This year, actually, and, and going into next year, the bill that I want to champion for the aerospace and defense industry uh, is AB 427 to create a California Aerospace Commission. I've spoken to many folks in the industry and they say that, well, you know, there's a lot of different groups. There's AMP SoCal, there's, there's uh, you know, other efforts that LAEDC and other groups ha have been heading up. But we need a central uh, organization that uh, will champion our industry to provide public private leadership at the state level to provide policy recommendations to the governor and legislature and how we can continue to grow and support the California aerospace industry. So I'm very excited to see all of you here today. I look forward to working with all of you to help write the next chapter of California's proud history of aerospace. Thank you very much. And we can speak to our legislators and we can educate all we want. 
But until you, as an industry, as a unified voice, start making yourself as loud as the agriculture and the entertainment industry, that's when you're gonna see some movement. And that's one of the things we wanna encourage here today and also encourage you through us and through your own partnerships and organizations uh, and industry associates that you have to make your voice heard about what you need in order to stay here and not move to Alabama or to South Carolina or heaven forbid to Texas. So we wanna keep you here in Southern California. At this time, I'm sure everybody in this room is aware that Southern California has an Air Force base in Los Angeles that doesn't have one plane on it. That's okay. What they make up for there is that they have a lead in the Space Missile Center. And we have with us today someone who is an innovator in an area where some might think that, you know, the innovation is really happening in the private sector with SpaceX and others. But he is an innovator in his own right, right within the Air Force Base, and we are happy to have this duel with us today. I'm not gonna take all the time to read his bio. You've got it in front of you. I want you to hear from him and be as mesmerized as we were when we first had the chance to meet him. This time I wanna bring up our keynote speaker, Lieutenant Colonel Rob Atkins. As Livy pointed out, I'm at the Space and Missile System Center. It's uh, El Segundo, kind of right by LAX. I don't know if you've seen it, but it is true. There is not a single airplane there, nor do they do anything that focuses on aircraft. Uh, within the directorates, we focus on satellites, we focus on launch vehicles, and we focus on the ground systems that get that communication down. So the uh, base is very small. There's no golf course. There's always a joke that within every Air Force base, there's a golf course. Um, but uh, so I came here today, I started thinking about what I was going to say, I started trying to write it down, I started trying to kind of do the uh, Saturday Night Live, you know, the Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. And it's, as you start doing it, I realize that I just can't do that. I can't have a process where I, you know, do step one, step two, step three. And so we'll see, maybe it's going to be a random babbling by Colonel Atkins. So I started working with AMP SoCal about a year ago. Um, I reached out, I started talking to Dion Jackson first, and then I started meeting the team. And the interesting thing about meeting the team is they kind of opened my eyes to a new um, perspective within the manufacturing that I hadn't had with me at first. So normally I would go, I would do pedigree reviews, I would look at flight hardware, I would inspect it, I would look at quality, I would look at what's going on in the factory relating to mission success, which at the time I really was attributing to the actual materials itself. Well, by coming to AMP SoCal and by hearing about this industrial base and how we need to maintain it, that's when you really start to see there's a lot more need of leadership. There's a lot more need of taking care of your people. So last time I spoke, I focused heavily on the space industry. That's what I'm an expert in. That's what I've been doing for 20 years. Today I'm going to focus a little bit more on leadership. So Mr. Marshall, I need your boss's phone number because step one, you take care of your people. You don't go to Hawaii, you send your people to Hawaii. I was in the Sibers program, I was running the DSP satellite systems. We had to go to Australia, and I had been at the, the helm of uh, the Sibers program for about a year. I had a captain who has spent four years there. The way the military works is four years is max. After you've been doing an assignment for four years, you move on. And so really, he was starting to see that he was about the PCS, so I sent him to Australia. And I said, hey, by the way, when you go there, you better take a week of leave, too. And so he did. He had a great time, great experience, and that's really what leadership is. It's taking care of your people first. So here's what happens. When you get promoted to a leader, everybody should feel sorry for you, because you're the first one who's going to take the shots. You're the first one who's going to take the fall. That's what you have to do. So when I go to factories now, I stop and I say, okay, who are the skilled laborers? And I talk to them and I say, how do you like the job? How do you like what you're doing? Almost all the aerospace companies, they absolutely love it and it's genuine, you can tell. I went to Virgin Orbit, first time I went, I didn't ask those questions. I was more looking at the flight hardware that Virgin's creating with the Launcher One, and that's here in Long Beach. Second time I went back, I focused almost solely on the, the skilled people. I just, how do you like the job? How do you like what you're doing? And they, they legitimately love it. Uh, there's work-life balance there. I got there, Monica can tell you, I got there about 4.30, and by about 4.45, it started getting pretty quiet. By about 5, it got pretty quiet. And then if you remember from the last biannual, Andrew Duggleby, the, uh, the rocket scientist, the true rocket scientist, uh, he, he left and he put on his PT gear and he went to go working out and Monica and I just talked for a while. 
But that shows you the work-life balance is there. They know they're going to have mission success. They know they're going to create a launch vehicle called Launcher One. But at the same time, they want their people to have good job satisfaction and a feeling of safety. When I look at an organization, there's a lot of people, they talk about return on shareholders' revenue. They talk about profit margins. They talk about customers and customer satisfaction. You know what an organization needs to do? They need to throw away all that stuff that gets confusing, and they need to think of themselves as a tribe. What's my tribe like? How are my people? Well, my people are safe. They know that I got their back. They know that I'm going to take care of them. And they know if there's a mistake, they're not going to be shown the door. I'm going to help them grow. I'm going to help them mature. The thing I like about this photo here is you see the earth. You see how small we are. At the same time, you can see islands, and you can see peninsulas, and you can see countries. Think of those as being tribes. And then within those areas, think of being your industry. So if your industry is textiles, on your island, you got your tribe, well, then there's somebody else, right? And then there's another competitor, and there's another company. In the aerospace industry, it was pretty much an oligopoly for since the 1950s when we were doing the space race. If you look, it's very hard to enter the aerospace industry. It's very expensive to enter it. And now these benevolent billionaires, as we call them, they're starting to do it. So if you look at that island in the past, it would have been a few major defense companies and the government. And that's the same thing in Europe. You have Arian Spas, fully government-funded, subsidized. Same thing with Russia, same thing with China, same thing with Japan. It is so expensive in the satellite, the rocket, the aerospace industry that you need that backing. Well, not in the United States. What happened is these billionaires realized, you know what? We can enter that market, we can drive down costs, and we can actually create a commercial business out of it. So what's happening now is there's a lot of discussions where the low Earth orbit, really close to the Earth, say like the International Space Station and kind of down, there's thoughts of just giving that over to the commercial industry in the first place. NASA turns their sights. They start focusing on human exploration. They start focusing on going back to the moon. I haven't even been alive since the last time we were on the moon. Can you believe that? And when somebody finally goes back to the moon, Neil Armstrong's footprints are still going to be there. So that's what NASA needs to do. They're turning their focus. They're starting to go. They're starting to create the SLS launch vehicle, the Orion capsule. They turn over the low Earth orbit domain to the commercial industry, and they start to make a business out of it. And that can happen. And that's what we're seeing here in Southern California. So today, I will answer any questions you guys have about space or anything you want to ask about space. But I want to focus a lot on leadership. And I think it's important, because I think that's what's going to drive the innovation. I think realizing that bringing manufacturing back to Southern California, due to all the new technical advancements that we have in manufacturing, and due to the demands of the customer, wanting an individual article or wanting something modified or changed, that's only going to be conducted when it's regionally based. And so that's what I'm going to focus on on this one. OODA loop. Raise your hand if you've heard of the OODA loop. OK, Monica, Ike. Come on, Ike. So Colonel Boyd, he was a fighter pilot in uh, the Korean and Vietnam War. And he was realizing that he was actually such an ace. He was probably one of the best fighter pilots out there. He, had, he was doing this and applying it, but he didn't know what he was doing. He just knew that he could respond quicker and faster than his adversary. So then he started writing in strategic guidance and strategic views, and it went into doctrine. So what the OODA loop is, is it's a process, and you can use it anywhere. You can ask my wife. She's right here. We use it at in and out I go to in and out and I'm like, stand back, family, I got this. We got four boys. I do not want to go to in and out and have every kid start telling me which thing they want or what they want. I get up there and I already know and I hit it and I'm done. I can order six meals and as fast as the average person orders one. But that's because when I step into in and out I step in with that mindset which says, I want to get in and be efficient and get out. It's stressful when the kids start saying, I want this and I want that. That's what your UDA is. You can use it anywhere. You can use it in business. It is a forward-thinking, uh, kind of um, sense of urgency approach to conducting business. Let's observe. OK, what do I observe in the changing environment? What do I observe internal to my company? And what do I observe external to my company? United Launch Alliance. You talk about a very reliable launch vehicle. They're observing competitors coming to the market. SpaceX, Blue Origin, Rocket Lab, Virgin. They're coming, and they're coming quick, and they're coming in with these new approaches to additive manufacturing, uh, big data, um, 
more rapid response, lower cost, do it more in-house, or you outsource it to a nearby manufacturing place that can do it cheaper than you, now you got subcontractors. All right, so what am I seeing going on? Well, I see that going on. Is it affecting my company? Well, what it means is I might wake up in a week and I actually might be behind the power curve now. Okay, so I'm gonna orient myself. Well, what are they doing? Oh, they're, they're doing 3D printing. Really, so they're printing plastic parts? No, they're printing Inconel, they're printing titanium, they're printing copper, aluminum, and they're doing it fast. They can print rocket engines quicker than they can machine them from another company. Rocket Lab hits print, and they come, home the ne they come back into work the next day, and there's a Rutherford waiting for them. If you tried to outsource that, they would say, okay, I'll get it to you in eight weeks. Well, if you start trying to launch 40 times a year, you can't wait eight weeks on an engine. So you're going to orient yourself. You're going to think about what's going on. What are these new inputs that I'm receiving? What is this new technology bringing? And then you're going to meet as a team, and you're going to decide. What is our COA? What should we do? How strong is our company doing right now? Is this an avenue we want to take on in the market? How are we going to implement this into our factory? And then you're going to act. And when you act, you're going to, you're going to roll out the whole team. You're going to get everybody on board. They're all going to agree that that is for the best interest of the company, and you're going to act, and you're going to move forward. Now, here's the thing. It's speed. Everybody has an OODA loop. Even, even companies that aren't succeeding and that are falling, they have an OODA loop, but it's extremely slow. General Hyten, the uh, U.S. Stratcom commander, just spoke recently. And he's like, you know what scares me? You know what I'm afraid of? It's not my adversaries. I'm afraid of how slow we are. We have forgotten how to fail, and we've forgotten how to take risks. Betty Sapp, the director of the NRO, she spoke at the National Space Symposium this year. She brought up the Corona Discover program. That was the first spy satellite that we ever launched. It literally had Kodak film on it. It took pictures of the... Uh, Soviets missile fields, the ICBMs, because we didn't know what they were doing behind the wall, did we? The U-2 could kind of go around the perimeter, but it couldn't really get inland. So the Corona program took off. The first mission was a failure. The second mission was a failure. The third mission was a failure. The fourth mission, the satellite made it to orbit, but the camera didn't work. The fifth mission was a failure. The sixth mission, the satellite made it to orbit, the canister didn't deploy. Being physical film, literally Kodak film, it had to deploy from the satellite, re-enter, and then be caught by an aircraft when the parachute came out. You look at the challenges that were going back on just to get this imagery. So finally, it was the 12th or the 13th mission was fully successful. The launch vehicle worked, it made it to its orbit, the satellite operated, it took the pictures, it deployed the canister, and the aircraft caught it. That one canister of film gave us more information on the ICBM fields of the Soviet Union than all U-2 uh, flights combined. But what would happen if it was today? What would happen if we had a launch vehicle failure? Oh, you're grounded for six months. And then if you had another failure, I'm sure that company or I'm sure that program that the government would be running would be terminated. That's what General Hyten and that's what Betty Sapp are saying. We've got to learn to take on risks, we've got to move fast, and we've got to be okay with faults. I'm not saying we're going to celebrate you blow up a rocket. We're not going to cheer, but we're going to say, okay, guys, we're learning. We're adapting. Our OODA loop has slowed down drastically in the last 20, 30 years. And now our leadership's fighting to get it back. And a lot of the commercial industry, a lot of these things that are going on in Southern California are driving that back and saying, we can do it. Rocket Lab, Virgin, SpaceX, Millennium Space Systems, NovaWorks, they're all saying we can move fast. They're all saying, look what we can do. And that's what we need. We need that. We need that sense of urgency, that speed. And the same thing with your companies. I don't, I don't care what you're manufacturing. I hope you're using some type of aggressive or sense of urgency to your activities. I hope you just don't keep showing up every day, you know, logging your hours, getting your work done, and going home. Things are adapting, and they're adapting fast. All right, your trade secrets. I was talking to Talbot at NovaWorks, and I said, hey, Talbot, uh, your images of your high set, it's too much. You don't, don't show it off because then you see all this hard R&D work that took place. There's a lot of effort that goes into making satellites so they can literally connect to each other. So can you imagine that? You can separate this satellite on orbit or you can send up parts and connect it back in orbit. I'm like, don't, don't do that. Talbot said, you know what, it's okay. 
Most of the secret sauce is in the software, and that's true. The, the technology, the software, the coding that we're doing now is so advanced that that's really where it is. So let's look at the space shuttle. Initial phase, 1970s, our whole focus is, okay, we need something reusable, something that can carry people and that can return on a low cost. Uh, I don't think we hit the low cost part, but we did have reusability. So from the 70s, we spent over a decade developing the space shuttle. There were all these iterations, right? Oh, it's going to be a rocket that rides on top of another rocket, and then it comes back. Or, oh, it's going to look like this, or, oh, it needs to look like that. You spend all the time in the R&D phase, which is the slow process, right? Because you got all these trials and errors, and you need, to, you, know, you need to present it to your team, and they need to poke holes at it and find out maybe something that's technically not feasible. That's what goes on. Look what happens. The USS Buran's first flight was 1988. Did you guys know that they had a space shuttle? They launched it once. It came home, and they said, whoa, that is crazy expensive. Never mind. Put that thing in a museum, and they did. But it looks pretty similar to the space shuttle, doesn't it? That's what happens when you're R&D. That's what happens when your trade secrets get out. Their OODA loop gets faster because they don't have that front edge. The moment you see a picture of the space shuttle, you're like, oh, OK, uh, blacks tiles, you know, paint some type of heat-resistive material. It's got the wings on them. They're relatively small because the thing's coming in at 17,000 miles an hour. So if you look, it was just simple for them to do. OK, how about explore another planet? So I asked you guys, OK, we're going to go to Mars, and we're going to drive around, or we're going to bounce around, or we're going to somehow roll this whole machine around. Well, what are we going to do, right? Because if you ever get stuck, you're done. So we spend all this time in these R&D phases creating these weird you know, robotic creatures, trying to see if they can go over rocks, trying to see if they can get out of a stuck position. And we come out with something. We're like, oh, there we go. That is what we created. That is what the brain power of NASA came up with. And that is what they have successfully launched, sent to Mars, and started to uh, explore the planet, right? Look what China just announced. Oh, yeah, we're going to have a rover in 2020. It looks pretty sim similar, doesn't it? That is because in their observing and their orienting and in their uh, deciding phase, they already had a head start. They already saw what we already did. So they're able to get running quicker. They don't have to start you know, trial and error and making these machines that fall over and they don't work. They just went for what worked and they produced it. Reusable rockets. What you see on the side of that boat right there, or that ship, is the uh, solid rocket motor on the side of the space shuttle, right? You have your main engine fuel tank, you've got your shuttle, and then you have the two solid rocket motors. That was reusability in the rocket industry. Why was it reusability? Because all it is is a solid rocket. It's literally, by the time it's spent, it's just a shell. So it has a parachute on the nose cone. That's why it's not pointy, because the parachute deployed. It lands in the ocean. They pick it up, and they bring it back. Now it has salt. It has corrosion everywhere. They have to refurbish it, and then they have to redo the solid materials to make the fuel again, and then launch it again. You can't do that with an engine. If you tried to take the Rutherford, or if you tried to take the, uh, the Newton from Virgin, you try to launch them, it, it's, the salt is just going to corrode. It's going to create foreign object uh, debris. It's going to mess it up. So what did SpaceX do? Well, they created a drone ship, and now they're landing on it. So what was impossible, absolutely impossible? The aerospace engineers would say, no, you can never land a rocket. They're doing it. And they're 25-year-old kids who are doing this. So what does your adversary to do, right? Well, SpaceX, it must be working. So look what I'm going to do. That's Blue Origin. That's Jeff Bezos' company. Looks pretty similar, doesn't it? All right, you guys say, well, Colonel Atkins, you know, I mean, that's just the way a shuttle looks. That's just the way a Mars rover looks. That's just the way a rocket lands. They land on drone ships. Well, sometimes little trade secrets that they put in there, a little bit of code, uh, get leaked out. On that Curiosity rover right there, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory up in Pasadena created the metal wheels. They actually laser cut out J... P, L in the wheels. So as this rolls around on Mars, it literally was going to leave tracks that were J, P, L. Well, somebody at NASA, because as you remember, NASA has about eight castles, and they all kind of have to get along. Somebody said, no, you're not going to do that. You cannot advertise J, P, L on your wheels. It's just going to be a metal wheel. So what did the uh, very uh, innovative engineers up in J, P, L do? 
They did Morse code. <laughs> Check that out. Literally, they put dot, dash, dash, dot, dash, dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, JPL. So now when it rolls around on Mars, it's literally putting in Morse code on its tracks where it goes. Trade secrets. China, when they presented this photo, and it's China's photo of their Mars 2020 rover, it has an L on the tire. They probably didn't even know why. They just realized, oh, you got to have holes. Maybe, you know, somehow the holes help it shock or something. So they created holes that are of the letter L. Those are trade seekers. That's what you guys have to hold near and dear to yourself. I went to Rocket Lab. First thing they said was, where's your phone? I'm like, what? They took my phone from me. So when I went into the factory, I couldn't take my phone. I'm like, oh, are we going in a skiff? A secure classified facility? No, no, no. We got, you know, proprietary stuff. I don't blame them. When, you're, when you believe you're running fast, and Rocket Lab is running fast, you don't want kind of the secret sauce getting out. And so that's these trade secrets that you guys need to hold near and dear. All right. I listed out eight things that I really think are uh, value-added in what we are doing in Southern California. 3D printing. That is actually a Rutherford engine. Rocket Lab. Daiquiri, augmented reality. Nova Works, works smarter and harder. Look at that thing. It's changing. It's morphing. It's shaping in orbit. The old adage which says, hey, if you, uh, if you don't get a college degree, you're going to dig ditches. That was presented to me. I had Virgin, uh, I had a tech, and I had Andrew Duggleby, their uh, rocket scientist, come to a local high school and talk to the kids. These kids are over at Hawthorne, and they are literally machining and 3D printing parts at school. They are creating drones that can fly 90 miles an hour. They're creating drones that can be pre-programmed and do everything autonomous and have a magnet and literally pick something up and carry it somewhere else. A lot of the kids have already settled for the fact that they're going to be in trade skills. And that's not a negative. There's a career college career approach. If you don't think you're mature enough, or you don't think you're financially stable, or if you don't think you're ready for college, go get a job in the industry. Learn these skills, apply them, and then if you think you're ready and you want to go to college, go to college, and then come back in a career fashion again, doing something the same company or something different. But when I talk to these people, uh, they come and they talk about it. The father at uh, Virgin, his son came home one day and he said, Dad, we're poor. And he's like, what are you talking about, son? And he said, well, you know, my teacher just sat and ranted about, uh, you know, for an hour about how if you don't go to college, you're going to be poor. And he's like, Dad, you work at a factory. And so he said, you're poor. He's like, son, have you ever done without? And he said, no, Dad. He's like, son, we're not poor. Yes, I work with my hands. Yes, I do CNC machining. Yes, I am a skilled laborer, but we're not poor. That's what these things are going to bring back to the United States. That mass just manufacturing where it's really not the skill of the person that's just stamping out materials. That stuff's going away. And you can look at it. The writings are on the walls. Everything's going to become regionalized again. Everything's going to become adaptable for the customer's needs. And look at everything. You got big data. You got artificial intelligence, digital twins, carbon composites. That's coming back. I love that bullet on the bottom. Tell me that is just not perfect. You don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. All right, uh, Gaia from Daiquiri, are you here? There you are. Welcome. Hey, the orange thing is uh, due to you. So we talked about the OODA loop, right? We talked about you got to have a fast cycle. Well, when I was talking with Gaia from Daiquiri, we brought that up. Tightly coupling the cycle. It's, it's a whole cycle, the design cycle, the build, the operate, and the maintain. You bring it together. You got to tightly couple it. You want to look at bottlenecks in your manufacturing? Don't just look at the manufacturing process itself. How did you design it? How are you maintaining it? What are you doing? That's, that, this is the change. This is what's coming. And this is what we're seeing right now in the aerospace industry. All right, thoughts on leadership. So these are just a few things, literally, I just put down that I have realized are important to me in the 20-year career in the Air Force. First off, being a leader means you put your people first, absolutely. It means you take one, too. If there's a mistake, if there's a fault, you take it, and you don't take it out on your people. Number one, do one decisive thing every day that gets you towards your goal. 
I don't care if your goal's, you know, external to what you're doing at work. Say it's fitness, getting your health back. Say it's, you know, it's your family. Say it's something you want to bring on in the work that, that's new, and you're going to start by learning about it, and then you're going to approach it to your boss. Do something, and it's got to be decisive every day. If I've had a hectic, crazy day, and I'm about to leave the office, and I realize I didn't do something decisive that gets me towards my goal, Maybe my goal is firing out an email to, you know, retain contacts with somebody or to let them know about what I'm doing. That, that's, that's what I mean by decisive. It's small, but your thought literally says, I'm going to do this. That's decisive. Here you go. How many people have seen emails longer than three sentences? Don't do it. Come see me. Go see your people. Something. Emails are for facts. The, the, the launch was a success today. Fact. The launch has been delayed two hours, fact. The, uh, the weather forecast is looking like 50% chance of uh, you know, high wind shears, fact. Don't come and start telling me there's an issue and it has an actuator problem and the Sibbers directorate is getting involved in an email. I've got a lot of questions, come see me. Emails are not your way of communicating when it's important and when there are biases or other thoughts to be had in there. Remember, you're always a leader on and off. I think I wrote this prior to everything that's going on in the news right now, and it's very applicable. I mean, look what's going on. All you got to do is just Google the Internet about the, the Hollywood area. Now it's rolling into the tech business, too. You're a leader on and off. You better watch how you carry yourself, and you better watch what you say off work, too. It'll, it'll come back and get you, and that's what they demand. So when I say it's hard to be a leader, it's hard to be a leader. You can't just get in, put on a face, and think, you know, when you get off work, now you're this new, you know, I don't know, kind of arrogant or this you're a superstar. No, you're not. You've got to stay humble. I think that's my next one. Uh, forge trust, exemplify values, define goals, and then back away. If you are the smartest person on the product or on the machine or on whatever you're doing in your field of regard that you're operating on, that's a mistake. You are not supposed to be. You're the leader. You're the one who helps them out. You're the one who gets them the issues or the needs. If there's something stuck, you're the one who gets in and intervenes and helps them out so that your team can keep progressing. You're not the one who says, stand back, let me show you how it's done. When you take over a leadership position, they should move you. Oh, okay, you know, you were in avionics, now I'm going to put you in propulsion. Whoa, wait, wait, I don't know anything about propulsion. Perfect, that's where you're going. And the reason is, is because you're not supposed to be in your team's chili. You're not supposed to be making them feel like you're the decision authority, or you're the one who's actually deciding. They should approach you and tell you why it's the best course of action. Trust. You can't make your people think that they might be losing their job in the future. You can't make your people think that fear is the way that the, you're going to get the best productivity out of them, because it's not. I've had both types of bosses. I've had the boss where I went in and I gave him or her the information they requested because that was it. And then I've had the boss where I've had this trust and where I've had this relationship with where I could have a conversation. Hey, have you heard what Daiquiri's doing lately? Have you heard about NovaWorks? Oh, no, I haven't. You start having a conversation, they start learning. I had an aerospace corporation guy come into my office and we talked for an hour over the industry. And when he got up, he literally said, thank you, Rob, that was very educational. I had no idea that was going on. So now what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to start a team within the Aerospace Corporation, I guess of the senior leaders, and he wants to know what's going on. He's going to flight follow Rocket Lab. He's going to flight follow NovaWorks. He's going to flight follow Millennium. Because as they start to really get their feet under them, and as they start to become maybe a source to acquire something from, they want to be aware of it. A leader sacrifices, protects, and takes the fall for the tribe. Think about it. All the old movies, whenever you would see a tribe, what would happen whenever, you know, the, the hostile people would come in? The leader was the first one up, right? In all the old great war movies, the leader's the first boot on the ground and the last boot off the ground. When you become a leader, people should tell you they feel sorry for you because you're about to take a lot more risks and you're going to take the fall. 2008, the banks, right? That's what infuriated everybody is they continued to get you know, their paychecks and their big bonuses while everybody else took the fall. That's not a leader. The more you achieve, the more humble you should become. 
Think about how true that is. If you're young and you're new to the industry and you're wanting to kind of, you know, show that you got the intelligence or you got the drive, that's okay. As you start to become more of a leader, as you start to take on more responsibility, you turn everything from yourself, you give it to your people, and you be humble. There's nothing to be arrogant about when you become a leader. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I had, I had a general, full room of generals, four-star commander of Air Force Space Command, typically two stars around the table. He briefed his part, and he said, eh, and that's about all my brain can hold. It's kind of funny to see you got this general, and he still has that about him, you know, humility. Don't set your boss up for failure. We were working on a satellite. We knew the boss was extremely risk adverse. Extremely risk adverse. So we have this meeting and we have all the brain power. We got the Aerospace Corporation, we got our CETA, we got our SNI, we got the military, we got the contractors. They're all on the phone and we're all talking about this satellite issue and we're determining can we launch with this or do we need to break the satellite apart? Satellites aren't made to come apart, you're breaking it apart. Do we break it apart to fix this piece, reinforce it so we can launch? We had four COAs. One of the COAs was fly as is. One of the other COAs was break the satellite apart, delay everything, six months, $200 million. So we start going through the COAs. The contractors are like, yeah, we can fly as is. Aerospace Corporation, we can fly as is. Military, yeah, we can fly as is. You know what their COA was? Break the satellite apart. Delay everything, cost money. That's nuts. They were going to make the boss come out and say, oh, well, we shouldn't do that one. We should do COA too. Why would you set your boss up for failure? If you were briefing me, I would assume you want me to break the satellite apart. That's not what they wanted, but that's the COA they went forward with. That was their course of action. No, don't set your boss up for failure. Ah, millennials. When I first heard about millennials, if you think about it, it almost goes against everything in the military, right? You respect me because of my rank. You respect me because I'm your boss. It almost sounds threatening to our culture, to the way we used to do things in the past. I tell you to do it, you don't ask a question, and you go do it. You start to learn more about millennials, like, oh my gosh, I think the millennials got it right. I don't want you to respect me because of my rank. I want you to respect me because of the way I treat you and because of my drive for what I want this organization to achieve. And hopefully they see that. And hopefully whenever I meet with them and I literally say, how are you doing? How was your move out to California for the first time in your life when you left your family? Are you okay? I really worked on that. It says millennials are driving. Well, they're not demanding. They're not... So I really worked on that part driving, and I think it's true. The organizations or your tribes are adapting to meet the millennials' needs because it's really just what the millennials almost expect, and it's not bad. I can work being a coach. I don't have to be the boss. I could be the leader or the coach or, you know, that's, that's my leader. Change the world. What's wrong with wanting to make an impact? What's wrong with when you get hired onto a company, you immediately want to start throwing out ideas and you want to be a part of it? Now, the one thing for the millennials I'll say is slow down. If you think you're going to make an impact in six months working at a company, what type of impact will you make in five years when you understand the ins and outs of the organization, you understand the ins and outs of the industry, and you understand what new technology you can apply to your company? It's going to be a lot, right? So expect it to take a while, but keep those ideas with you. They want flexible work schedules. I don't think there's anything wrong with a work-life balance. You can hire people on and you can burn them hard and hot and it won't last too long. I talked to a guy once, he moved to a new company and I said, hey, how'd you like your old job? He's like, it was good. He goes, it cost me a marriage, but it was good. That's not an answer, good God, really? You worked so hard, so many hours that your marriage fell apart. No, let's have a work-life balance. Let's work hard though and let's play hard. When you get there, don't get on Facebook and don't start playing around and don't start you know, taking care of you know, your bills. Get there and work and then get out and get done. At the headquarters building when I was there, the branches around me, they would stay there till six or seven o'clock at night. I used to walk by some of their offices and they were on Facebook at 445. Wait, you're now gonna sit here on Facebook for the next hour and 15 minutes just because the perception says that you need to be there till six o'clock? No. 
get your work done, take your phone, your, uh, your, uh, your leash, take your phone home, and if your boss emails you, you can answer back. But don't sit in the office till six, just because you think you need to. So that's what we're really seeing from the millennials, and I think I can work with it, and I think your tribes can work with it too. I mean, it should be something that we're not threatened by. Uh, it comes across as entitled, but trust me, um, they're unsure of themselves, and they're unsure of kind of what they're wanting out of life too. That's the other thing. The old way was you get a job, right, and you just sit in that chair for 40 years until you retire. That's not what millennials want either. By making that impact, by really wanting to get in there and make change, they're willing to leave your company in six months to a year to two years if they're not happy. What well, was my final bullet? If you think about it, it's true. It says people will forget what you said, what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I, think, I can think of Colonel Alvin Burst right now, how he made me feel. I can think of Colonel Mike Moran, how he made me feel. Those were my leaders. Those were the people who I worked hard because, I, one, I didn't want to let them down, and two, I wanted to show them that you know, I really appreciated what they were doing and how their leadership style was. So you remember how your boss has made you feel. Every time you're around your boss, you got that pucker factor, you froze up, you talked very little, you just wanted to get out of that office. Every time you got around your leader or your coach, you just let everything out. You told them what your weekend was, you told them about the good, you told them about the bad, you told them about an article you read. That's good communication. Thoughts get shared. How do you get others to understand your vision? Oh, is that on there? Oh, no. Oh, oh, we've got one above that. <laughs> Are we going to do the two. top one? Um, yeah, because they, they keep, so everybody understands how this works. It's all ah. crowdsourcing. So as they get more votes, is the ones who go up to the top. So we got the, the next one is how do you get others to understand your vision? I think when you back away and you realize your tribe, you're sending your warriors out and that they're putting uh, their lives in harm's way, that's really what your mission should be. And so for me, when I look at my vision and what I'm trying to do, I literally think of the warfighter. When I was downrange, when I was deployed, I was doing space assets, and I could see the capability they could do to stop IEDs, to stop uh, unprepared conflict, and that is what I brought back with me. At SMC, I would recommend, or I would suggest, that nobody could become a senior material leader till they deployed. And there's a lot of people at SMC who have never deployed. They have spent 20, 25, 30 years CONUS their whole time. And that's not OK. Because when the warfighter is your number one focus, you need to see what they go through. They don't go through uh, Sharkies or Hennessy's at nighttime, no. They go overseas, they're sleeping in tents, and they're bringing on lots of risk and danger. I was there when Fob Bastion happened. It's a forward operating base managed by the British. Marine Corps were there, and it was the greatest attack to U.S. assets since Vietnam. I think they lost seven Harriers, and a lieutenant colonel, and I believe a uh, captain. Anyways, the Marines lost two lives. So, how do you get them to understand your vision? You gotta tell them three times. First time you tell somebody something, they're against it, they're resistive of it. Second time you tell somebody something, they almost think, okay, I could see that. Guess what happens on the third time you tell them something? It's their idea. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, this is your idea. You run with it. But that's what happens. That's usually how you get the vision across, it seems. How are you approaching international responsibilities under the six main <sighs> space treaties when it comes to dealing with commercial space? Um, I'm not a fan of going overseas to resolve any type of cost issues. I see what's going on in the launch domain, and just because an India PSLV costs less than a CONUS launch, that's not a reason for me to want to see our satellites going overseas to launch. If you're talking about New Zealand and you're talking about Rocket Lab, that's a different story. That's one of our Five Eyes, that's one of our partners. Also, they're willing to put their factory right here in uh, Huntington Beach. So I went there, Shane, Brad, talked with them, and I got to see what they're doing, and they're actually producing the engines here in the United States. Avionics are coming, structures are coming, vessels are coming, so they're bringing it in. If you're talking about ITAR and partnering with people, it's been said that Cassini, the satellite that went to Saturn, had ITAR been in place when Cassini was developed, we would have never been able to uh, launch because the partnerships wouldn't have worked. ITAR would have severed us to bring our technology to them. So that's a tough one to crack. But ideally, what I would like to see is U.S. launch vehicles, U.S. satellites, 
being acquired and processed out of the United States. I'm going to ask a couple more questions before we move into our panel, which he is also graciously moderating. The next question we have at the top is, how did you decide what area, fo area to focus on in your career and evaluate where you could make the most impact on the world? Um, it's a good question because I'm a space operator by trade. A space operator means you actually operate the assets for the warfighter. You don't acquire them. You don't do the, uh, the, you know, the full operational capability. You don't do the uh, efforts that bring on a new product. So when I was in EWI, Education with Industry, at the Lockheed Martin plant at Waterton, it was a crossover. So what they did is they took an operator, they threw them in the business or the acquisition domain, and then they required a follow-on back to SMC, the Space and Missile System Center here at Los Angeles. And so that was about 2006, 7, 8. And then I went into the NRO did some acquisition there, and then I went back to Colorado Springs to go in my operator billet again. I really saw that the impact I could make was coming back to SMC, bringing my knowledge of being an operator back here and trying to really change or re-steer the ship of acquisition to make it faster and more agile. The funny thing was is it literally took eight stars to get me back here. It took three-star General Greaves, it took two-star General Buck at the time, who's now a three-star, and then it took an SCS named uh, Miss Barbara Westgate, three-star equivalent. They all put down on my vector where they want me to go, SMC. And then a captain denied it. Oh, he's not supposed to go to SMC. He's an operator. He's supposed to go somewhere else. Guess what happened? It was fixed in 30 minutes. Miss Westgate called in a general said, what the heck are your people thinking? And they fixed it within 30 minutes, and it was even backdated. I received the denial on like a Monday, and my paperwork was like a Thursday of the week prior. So they really jumped through hoops making that one happen. Okay, we're going to ask one more question. The next one's got a tie. Oh, no longer a tie. Okay. How do you inspire corporate leaders to support work-based learning, thus supporting their workforce pipeline? Um, I'm starting with the kids. I'm starting with high schools. So uh, I'm doing the Space Innovation Academy, and the idea is, is I'm taking everything I've learned from the Naval Postgraduate School, Space System Ops, and I'm taking all the space trainings I've had, 100, 200, 300, and I'm applying that into curriculum for the kids so they actually see what's going on in Southern California. This really is the epicenter of the space industry. When a company decides they want to get into the uh, commercial domain of space, they actually put their company right here because they know where this is where the brain power is, this is where the skills are, and then this is also where probably SMC is to where the acquisition arm of Air Force is in the space domain. But um, the main thing is, is to let the kids know they have options. So when they told, Mike Yates from uh, Virgin told the class that his dad said, you'll be digging ditches if you don't go to college. I asked the kids, I said, how many people have heard if you don't go to college, you'll be nothing? They all raised their hand. And I'm like, guys, there is never a stop date when you can't get into college. 10 years, you could go work in the industries. You could bounce around. You could learn certain things. You could do studying. And then if you want to go to college, that's fine. But the thing to think is, OK, Dad, I'm going to dig ditches. You know what? I'm going to start a sprinkler company. I'll actually be an entrepreneur. I'll start my own business. But though, that mindset can be out there. If you see that Dirty Jobs by Mike Rowe, work smarter and work harder. We have people who go through the theory of college and they never once apply it, usually that's your washout rate. Because not, by not actually applying the hands-on skills to some type of technical, some type of engineering, and all you do is learn the theory, it's hard to hang on. You have to keep understanding and you have to look at things from a different angle. Well, the more you do it hands-on, it's easier to apply those theories. You see how effective they are. Yeah.